This is a production of Cornell University. My name is, is Nick Vanderwall. I'm a professor in the government department and the current director of the Mario Ainaudi Center for International Studies, uh, which is organizing um, this event. The Mario Ainaudi Center uh, is, um, as many of you no doubt know, the sort of main institution on campus for uh, the promulgation of international studies. We, we oversee uh, the, in, the, the programs in international studies, area studies. Uh, we provide grants to students uh, and to faculty, notably for field research and, 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 uh, and travel uh, abroad. And we organize a number of events uh, during the course of, of the year. Um, let me say that, uh, that the Ainati Center has a, a fantastic staff. Uh, I want to thank the staff for organizing uh, today's event uh, seamlessly. Uh, to paraphrase CNN, um, I've got the best damn international studies staff in the business. Uh, so thank you. Um, the topic today is uh, foreign policy issues uh, for the next president. I'll briefly introduce uh, the topic and then, intro and, and then introduce uh, our two main speakers. Uh, can you all hear me? Uh, yeah? Yeah? Okay, because I'm, I'm not sure. The mic is apparently... Uh, it's working? Yeah? Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, in, I'll introduce our two speakers, Peter Katzenstein and, and David Patel, both of whom are professors in the government department uh, uh, in, in, when it's uh, their time to talk. I, I, I want to uh, very briefly talk um, uh, to sort of set the outlines of, of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, between the three of us, I, I don't think we'll talk for a full hour, and that, that'll leave plenty of time for some questions and, and comments uh, from the floor after, after the talk, after the talks. Um, what is today's theme? Well, uh, this is an election year, and there's a widespread sense that the outcome of the presidential election will have a powerful effect on, on all areas of, uh, of public policy in the U.S., but in particular uh, in the area of, uh, of foreign policy. I think more than at any time since maybe 1968, uh, uh, there is a sense that that uh, 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 or the, the, there is a sense that foreign policy is at the core of, of this year's uh, election. Uh, the campaigns are saying it. I mean, if you listen to the Democrats, uh, they, they're saying that the election is a chance to get out of Iraq. Uh, they're saying more, more generally that the election is a big chance to move away from uh, cowboy diplomacy. Okay? Uh, if, if you listen to the McCain campaign, uh, they talk about the, the dangerous world out there and the extent to which uh, Obama is much too green, much too inexperienced uh, to deal with uh, that world. Uh, and in, indeed, that he doesn't understand the military, that he never did his military service, he never served. Uh, and so he's really ill-equipped to deal with uh, the broad issues. Um, it used to be that people in Washington said that, that politics ended at the water's edge. This was a way of saying that foreign uh, affairs, foreign policy was largely bipartisan. Uh, that clearly has, has stopped being the case and, and has not been the case for much of the last uh, 20 years. Uh, foreign policy has increasingly been uh, characterized by partisanship uh, and sometimes quite harsh rhetoric on, on both sides uh, of, of the aisle. Uh, so there is a sense as well that, you know, if you have really a, no longer a bipartisan foreign policy, that there are going to be sharp discontinuities when you have changes of, of government. Finally, if you read the European press, uh, then one also gets a sense of uh, 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 discon con discontinuity uh, coming up very, very soon. Uh, uh, the Europeans seem to hold, I think, enormous hope that the next president will, will mark a, a sharp disjuncture with, with the present administration and that, that the next president really will change the course of U.S. foreign policy uh, and, and, and the course of the last eight years. I think, I think it's fair to say that, that most Europeans think that major change is, is coming down the pike. So I guess I want to, in the face of all these arguments for the likelihood of change, um, I, I want to ask what specifically can we expect to change 
in, in, the, in the next couple uh, years. Uh, 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 David Patel uh, will speak after me and will speak specifically about Iraq, about which he has uh, uh, far more expertise than, than, than I do. Um, uh, uh, I will just very briefly mention a, a couple areas. Um, I think, I, I want to say at the outset that I hope for change in a number of areas. Uh, I view change uh, as highly desirable and necessary across a number of areas. I mean, without seeming to be uh, a partisan, it seems to me pretty clear that the U.S. is not as popular uh, and U.S. power... Uh, uh, I, get a, I get a sense of the kind of crowd that says, yes. Uh, uh, that the US, U.S. power is less legitimate today than it once was around the world. I think anybody who travels abroad will, will confirm that. Um, similarly, it seems to me absolutely beyond dispute at this point uh, uh, that, that uh, uh, much more international attention is needed to, for issues of global warming and, and climate change, and that, that this attention is long overdue. Similarly, it strikes me as uh, as something that, that, that even uh, this administration's uh, uh, supporters wouldn't contest, uh, that U.S. policy in the Middle East is adrift and, and not going in any particular direction uh, and seems at times uh, uh, quite chaotic. Uh, nuclear proliferation in North Korea and Iran is, is preoccupying. Uh, and the progress these countries are making towards developing a nuclear arsenal uh, and increasing their nuclear capabilities doesn't really seem to be affected uh, by the U.S. policy, or I would say the different U.S. policies uh, over the course of the last eight years. I, I won't even mention the international trade system uh, and, and the rise in protectionist uh, sentiment, not only in the U.S., but virtually everywhere in the world, that I think has a, a good chance of dismantling the progress of trade reforms of the last 40 years uh, in the future. I, I won't either also mention uh, the failure of the international community to do very much about the persistence of poverty uh, in, in sub-Saharan Africa and in about 40 or so countries around the world uh, which, which are, are simply not getting any richer and have gotten poor relative to the West over the course of, of, the, of the last 30 years. Um, collapsed states, I won't mention either. Uh, they, they, uh, they exist in virtually every region of the world, and it's remarkable how long once a collapsed state has, has once a state has collapsed, how long it takes uh, to get them back on their feet again. Uh, these collapsed states breed violence, they breed terrorism, uh, and again, one doesn't get the feeling of, mo of any kind of progress in dealing with these collapsed states over the course of the last decade. Um, let, me, let me also say that I think it matters who is elected. I, I, I don't think that, that this is a choiceless election. Uh, but I do want to make the case that foreign policy continuity is much, much more likely uh, uh, than discontinuity. And I want to give you at least two sort of general reasons for which I think there will be less change uh, than, than uh, one might think. The first, very, very broadly, is that change is difficult. Okay? An entrenched bureaucracy prevents it. Interest groups lobby against it. And people fear it. Popular support for the status quo always tends to increase once the alternatives are actually weighed. So people are for change in theory, uh, but uh, in practice, they, they rarely act for it. Um, Washington seems moreover structured to prevent change. You know, some will say, well, the Democrats may well control both houses, and so we would have, a, 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 we could have a Democratic president and two Democratic houses. I, I, I still think that's the likeliest outcome of this election. Um, you know, but yeah, but uh, united is not usually an adjective that comes to mind uh, <laughs> when we think of the Democrats. Um, moreover, if you were going to try to build a system that systematically prevents positive and logical change, I think the best thing you could do is probably to study contemporary Washington, D.C., uh, with its 
institutional balance of power that is deeply conservative, where basically every major change has to go through at least uh, two uh, of the three uh, uh, bodies of government. Um, with its K Street lobby uh, industry, which is devoted almost entirely to supporting the status quo, and finally with its talking heads aristocracy that regularly ridicules anything that's slightly unconventional. Uh, both McCain and Obama can make, I think, as good a claims as, as any presidential candidates in the last 40 years to be mavericks and outsiders uh, and, and for change. Uh, but think back to what happened to Jimmy Carter and his band of Mary Georgians uh, when they arrived in Washington uh, uh, some, some 30 years ago. So that's sort of the first reason. It's just, you know, if, if change was easy, it would happen more often. My second reason, uh, very briefly, is, has to do with the place, the structural place of the U.S. in the world. For good and bad, the U.S. is the only superpower left after the end of the Cold War. Uh, and I think that's the primary reason. I just don't think that the Western alliance and a kind of international sense of purpose uh, will return to the glory days of the alliance uh, during the Cold War. Uh, Anti-Americanism, anti I think it's useful to remember, started to increase well before George Bush entered the White House. Uh, the idea that, that we will re-become popular all over the world uh, uh, once, uh, you know, that cowboy or le cowboy, as they say in Paris, uh, is out of uh, office, I think is, is, uh, is naive. Um, my own view is that things like closing down Guantanamo Bay in my view, long overdue, um, will nonetheless not make much of a dent in the current opinion polls around the world about, about the US and about US society and about US power. Um, so that, that's on the one hand. On, on the other hand, and in addition, the, the fact that the US is so, is so powerful uh, is sort of at odds with what I would call a kind of disutility of, of power. Uh, our ability to affect change around the world is actually pretty limited. Uh, if, if there's one lesson about Iraq, it seems to me, it's that our, our, our awesome military arsenal is really not all that useful uh, for most of the kinds of conflicts that we face around the world. And we, I think we notice that in Iraq on a daily basis. It's said that the next administration has to pay attention to soft power uh, rather than focus only on hard power. Uh, well, yes, again, I very much agree with that sentiment. Uh, but you know, soft power is, is tricky to wield. It works in a diffuse kind of way in the long run. Uh, but it's actually not all that useful in the short run. Uh, uh, and, and it's very, very tricky and difficult to use, uh, which is uh, one reason that even an administration devoted to uh, multilateralism uh, and international collaboration um, uh, um, we'll, we'll find it tough to wield that soft power. Uh, um, you know, even if the next administration is willing to cut defense spending, say, and put more back into the State Department, or uh, actually tax U.S. citizens to pay for some global public goods uh, that are probably necessary to assert American power, uh, it's not clear to me that the position of the way that other view, countries view us, their willingness to collaborate, will change uh, all that much. Okay, so I, I will stop there and uh, introduce the uh, next speaker. Uh, and I'm I, I, my sense from talking before uh, this is that there's a, a healthy m amount of disagreement amongst the three of us, so uh, you'll, you, you'll get other points of view uh, very shortly. Uh, the next speaker uh, is Professor David Patel. Uh, he teaches comparative politics with a focus on Middle Eastern politics, Islamic institutions, and political culture in the government department here at, at Cornell. Uh, his research analyzes the current ability of Islamic institutions to shape patterns of collective action. He combines game theory and, eth and ethnography to examine how Islamic institutions and symbols provide individuals information that facilitates powerful political coordination and enhances social solidarity. Uh, David um, has the distinction of, of being one of the last 
uh, American scholars to do field work in Iraq in 2003-2004. Uh, he worked there on, on trying to understand how mosques and clerical op organizations affected local public goods provision and national political coordination. Uh, please welcome David Patel. Thank you. I taught a 120-person Middle Eastern politics class this semester, and it's great to look out. No one's text messaging. There's no laptop, no Facebooking going on in the back. Maybe back there, but so uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. And I'd like to say that attendance for Cornell alums seems to be higher at class than for Cornell current students, which we'll have to do something about. I'm going to focus most of my time today on Iraq instead of the general Middle East, but during the q and I'm sure we, we can certainly talk about large issues in the Middle East. And what I really want to do today is give you a sense of the challenge that the next president is going to face in Iraq by first focusing on the downturn in violence in Iraq, why it's occurred, and then really trying to disaggregate patterns of violence that we see in Iraq. And one of my primary goals is to complicate your vision of the sort of violence that's occurring in Iraq, and that it's not primarily between three homogenous groups, and that just as much, if not most of the violence in Iraq is within these groups that we normally talk about. So in January 2007, President Bush announced the new way forward, or also known as the surge. Troop numbers increased from about 132,000 in early 2007 to about 168,000 by September. They redivided Baghdad, Baghdad broke it up into nine different security areas, and started doing counterinsurgency in slightly different ways, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. The purpose of this was to create breathing space for the Iraqi politicians to work out lingering problems. A number of Sunni Arab politicians had agreed to participate in the elections in December 2005, and I'll talk about this again in a second, on the condition that certain lingering issues, the Constitution, oil sharing, rules on the formation of regions, amnesty for insurgents, standing militias, these issues would be addressed. So the whole purpose of the surge, the purpose of trying to get violence down in the, in the short and medium run, which McCain's right, it, 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 it's occurred, violence is down, that's why you didn't see it so much in the democratic debates uh, towards the end. The purpose of it was to create breathing space for politicians to work out their problems. And for the Iraqi government, which is a real government, it's, it's, it's there because the Americans are there, if the Americans disappear, the Iraqi government would probably collapse tomorrow, but for it to work out internal disagreements. So the violence in Iraq. The new way forward really wasn't that much of a new way forward in the sense that I think the Bush administration has had a fairly clear and coherent vision of the Sunni Arab insurgency in Iraq. And they see the Sunni Arab insurgency, which is responsible for the vast majority of the attacks, uh, probably against civilians and certainly against American soldiers. They see it divided into three different groups. The first are Salafi jihadists who want to destabilize Iraq to kill Americans. And initially they were mostly foreigners. Over time, it's become increasingly Iraqi, and it's overwhelmingly Iraqi now. It makes up a very small percentage of the overall number of insurgents, but they're responsible for a lot of the most egregious attacks, especially the attacks against civilians. And the, the U.S. military likes to call them al-Qaeda in Iraq, although there, there, there actually is no group in Iraq that calls itself al-Qaeda in Iraq. There was a group that called itself al-Qaeda fil balad al al-Qaeda in the land of the two rivers, but it's easier to say al-Qaeda in Iraq for, for domestic political reasons. But they were, they, so they were a small group, the Salafi jihadists. And they were responsible for a lot of the most egregious attacks because one of their strategies was to provoke retaliation from Shiites onto moderate Sunni Arabs to radicalize or to bring more of the Sunni Arabs who would participate onto their side of the, of the political spectrum. The second group of insurgents were what the U.S. government liked to call Baathists. And they were former... People affiliated with the regime are clearly who'd be locked out of power in any sort of debothification. And remember, the debothification was largely pushed by the Iraqi politicians, the exile politicians who came back. Even when the American, act, American politicians wanted to draw some of those restrictions back, it was the Iraqi politicians that said, no way, Jose. Um, the Baathists, we were, it's not very unclear how, much, how, how unified they are exactly where they are. But again, they're a pretty small percentage of the overall insurgents. The vast majority of the insurgents in Iraq are what the military used to call POIs, pissed off Iraqis. And the POIs, the POIs are a very diverse group. A lot of them are young specialists in violence who lost their jobs. A lot of them are, are tribesmen who felt like their sheikh was slighted. Um, a lot of them are, national, are, are real nationalists. Their country's being occupied. Uh, and if you remember that movie Red Dawn from the 1980s, 
Remember the goosebumps you get when Patrick Swayze screams Wolverines and launches uh, and guerrilla attacks on the Soviets occupying the U.S.? That's, that's, that's what it looks like when you watch these, these uh, propaganda videos that these uh, POI insurgents release and that they download from the video. We call them terrorist attacks, but they're seeing it as, many of them are seeing it as nationalist resistance to an occupier. So the POIs, POIs are a diverse group, young specialists in violence who lost their jobs, tribesmen, nationalists, um, young Sunni Arabs who feel like they're not going to have any, any future in Iraq. Remember, this is an oil state. 85% of the economy is going to be the central government. So your ability to move into the middle class, make your children's lives better, is largely dependent on your ability to get government contracts, to get government jobs. So they feel like they're locked out of that. U.S. counterinsurgency strategy from the beginning has been to buy off enough of the POIs to make it harder for the Salafi jihadists and the Baathists to do their thing. And from early 2003, you saw them pursuing this. The main way they tried to do it early on was to bring Sunni Arabs into the political process. They were unsuccessful in the January 2005 elections. Sunni Arabs simply did not participate. But they did participate in extremely large numbers in the December 2005 elections. And a lot of Sunni Arabs, and they certainly were not hand-picked individuals. We can think of Adnan Delaney and his Salafi list who participated and did better than any other Sunni Arab group. The Muslim Brothers in Iraq, um, the, the Iraqi Islamic Party, basically the same thing. They participated in large numbers. There were neo Baathists, head by Saleh Mutlaq. You may recognize some of the names. So they participated in large numbers in the December 2005 elections. And they're there. They're in parliament. Some of them are members of the ruling government. But the purpose was for them to go back and buy themselves a constituency among the POIs, give them jobs, get some of these insurgents to put down their weapons, and to try to to, to, to suck up some of that support for the other insurgent groups, where you'll start to get better information. Counterinsurgency, in many ways, is about getting good local information. Who are the insurgents? Who aren't the insurgents? Where are bases? These, this, sorts of, this sort of information. So the hope was that that, that would succeed. But before that government was formed after the December 2005 elections, there was a really egregious bombing in February 2006 in Samarat. And this was probably done by some of the Salafi jihadists. And it was an attack against one of the holiest shrines for Shias. It's where, 12 of the, it's where two of the 12 Shia imams are buried. And it's where the 12th imam, the Mahdi, went into occultation. It's where the Messiah went into occultation. So it, it, it was a very controversial attack against the heart of Shiism. And it provoked retaliation in ways that previous attacks meant to provoke retaliation hadn't. Up until that point, whenever these attacks occurred against Shias, and they targeted everyone. They targeted schools, hospitals, different political parties, different factions, trying to provoke retaliation. Largely failed because of Grand Ayatollah Ali Asistani. After every one of these attacks, he'd come out through Friday sermons and tell people, don't retaliate. This is what they want you to do. Resist this. He failed in February 2006. And we can talk about why he failed. But after February 2006, there were a number of uh, retaliatory attacks by Shia militias on Sunni Arabs. And I argue that the violence in Iraq changed dramatically after February 2006. The attacks became less Iraqi government forces versus Sunni militias, and it became more militia-on-militia violence. And since February 2006, after his legitimacy, I'd say, got knocked down a bit by failing to get people to... to, to uh, to, to take the hit and not retaliate. Sistani's been relatively quiet. He still comes out some. He's pr been particularly active in the last month issuing fatwas on some controversial issues. Not fatwas, bayan statements, not official religious dictates. But Sistani has been out of the news largely because of that failure. So since January 2007, in this new way forward, violence is down not necessarily because of the number of US troops that are there. Even when we say 168,000 troops, I don't know what the tooth-to-tail ratio is for the U.S. forces. It's classified. But tooth-to-tail is the number of troops you need supporting every one man or woman on the front lines. And it's pretty abysmal for the U.S., probably six to one. So even when you hear 168,000 troops, that means you probably only have about 20 to 25,000 U.S. soldiers or servicemen or women out on, on patrol actually fighting. So the numbers clearly were not that much of a difference. The reason why violence has been down in the past year and a half is because the U.S. is doing counterinsurgency different. We're buying off militias. And this comes in different phrases. The Awakening Councils, the Sons of Iraq movements, the Concerned Local Citizens Brigades, wonderful phrases. 
The way it actually works, and I just came back from some interviews in DC, is that a second or third or fourth shake in, in the area, usually shakes are like a pyramid, so you're taking not a guy at the top, a guy in the middle, he comes and volunteers and says to the local US military troops, I want to help protect my community. So the US says, great, we're going to give you a 90 day contract to protect this three to five miles of road. And we're going to pay you to pay men to patrol this area and keep it safe. And that's how it's happening. That's why violence is down, because we're empowering local militias, usually tribes. And those tribes are only powerful, though, because the guy has the contract. If he wasn't a manpower contractor, no one would listen to the sheikh. But controlling them, using them to, to root out the first two groups of insurgents, Salafi jihadists and the Baathists. But by empowering them, you're also making them the local Don Corleone family in that three to five mile strip of road. You're giving them power to dictate all the extortion racketeering. They're now in control of all the oil smuggling in that area. All the reconstruction money and contracting is going through those concerned local citizens. So we've gotten this downturn in violence. We've gotten this breathing space. But we've bought it by creating new militias. We've gotten it by empowering new actors that threaten not only the Iraqi government, but in many ways have delegitimized and challenged the Sunni Arab politicians who came on board with the political process back in 2005. And there's a lot of talk now about what provincial elections are going to look like in October or November of this year. One of the reasons why they're going to be so controversial is because the Shias not only are internally divided, and I'll talk more about that in a second, but it's very unclear how much of an electoral hit the Sunni Arabs who participated in the elections back in 2005 are going to take vis-a-vis -vis these tribal militias that the US has used in the past year and a half to try to get some semblance of order in the so-called Sunni Arab Triangle. So I'm not going to talk too much about divisions within the, within the Shia camp, but I do want to talk a little bit about Mukta the Sadr, because in many ways the future of Iraq is, what is, is with the Sadr movement, one way or another. Five years, ten years, what happens with the Sadr movement is, is going to determine the future of Iraq. And there's basically three ways you can see the Sadr movement. The first is as a social movement. And this is how I think Juan Cole, if any of you read his blog, tends to see the Southern movement. So it's, it's a movement of the disenfranchised youth, the urban working class and poor, who have some connections to, to tribes. Um, a lot of them moved up to these areas of Baghdad and Basra and other large cities uh, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and especially in the 80s and 90s under, under war conditions and sanctions. The social movement approach sees them as motivated by ideology and religion. There's a millenarian tie to them. And internal divisions on the, uh, among them don't seem to matter that much in that view. They're united and ideologically. The second view is the way I think the US military sees them, and also how uh, Anthony Shadid, for example, the Washington Post. A lot of the Baghdad-based journalists tend to view them as a very hierarchical, disciplined, centralized organization. And the, instead of seeing images of street rabble, you see images of they look like Hezbollah sharp Mahdi army guys in uniform, marching lockstep, very organized. And they see it as a, as a, a, as a growth out of uh, Muqtada's father's network of charities and welfare programs. And there's a debate about whether or not Muqtada has control over the whole organization, or whether or not Tehran next door in Iran has, has control of the organization. It's a very convenient vision of the Southern movement if you want to say that the problems in Iraq are because of neighbors, and that the solution to peace in Iraq is putting pressure on Tehran. The third view of the Southern movement, which a lot of my research uh, um, uh, was focused on, was really seeing the Southern movement as, as a loose grouping of local criminal and rogue elements with very little centralized control, focused very much on local protection, local black markets, local racketeering, and there's Iranian funding for some of the elements, but not much hierarchical, disciplined, centralized control. And uh, I, I, from my impression of the Southern movement and how it varies from country to country, and a lot of the so-called mistakes Muqtad has made seems to, seems to fit that last view uh, much more closely. And I, should, I should say just a, a, a pitch for some of the things Cornell's done around town uh, in, the, in the past year. Um, Judge Ra'ad Juhi, who's a fellow over in the, in the law school, um, a very high profile Iraqi lawyer. A lot of people know him as uh, the chief investigative judge on, the, on, the, on Saddam's criminal tribunal. He's really here in the United States and can't go back to Iraq because in April, two in April 2003, Abdul Majid al-Khoui was assassinated when he came back to Najaf. And 
This is the secret Iraqi judge who issued the arrest warrant for Mukta the Sadr in August 2003 that was not enforced until conveniently Bremer and uh, Ricardo Sanchez wanted to arrest or kill Mukta in April 2004. So they used this arrest warrant as a pretext to go after him. So in many ways, Judge uh, Rajuhi, uh, who's here at Cornell for the next uh, two years, his, uh, his history in the past three, four years is the history of uh, Iraqi politics. So a lot of the fighting we see between, Iraq, between Shia factions, I think, uh, shows us that the violence is not only between Sunni groups, but just as much between Shia groups. And I'm thinking about the fighting in Basra, fighting over the shrine cities, and I think we're going to see this intensify uh, immediately before and after the provincial elections. So we'll conclude by saying, what's the, what, what do I see as the central problem in Iraq? The central problem, I think, in Iraq is that groups can't trust that agreements they reach today with each other will be respected into the future. They can't know that any agreements, whether the constitutional agreements or informal agreements, will still be respected by other groups after the U.S. pulls its troops out. And it's very hard to create those expectations that other groups will trust these, tr trust these agreements and have an incentive to follow those agreements when U.S. military support for some groups is no longer there. This is compounded by the problem that groups don't know how strong they are relative to one another. They haven't been able to fight it out. They haven't been able to figure out where their real bases of, of operation are. And they haven't been able to engage, and I don't want to say in street battles, but they haven't been able to engage in street battles without the US interfering to sort themselves out with their relative, into their relative strengths so they have a position from which to negotiate, have an incentive to negotiate. So as long as the US is there, I think it's very difficult for them to get those, to get those beliefs about relative strengths and have an incentive to create agreements that will be sustainable after the U.S. turns down. And I think regardless of who's elected in the next presidential election in the United States, those central challenges are not going to change. You're going to face the same problems within Iraq, the same insurgencies. They're not suddenly going to put down their arms if Obama is elected. The Iraqi government isn't going to suddenly start negotiating with a different set of preferences in mind. And that relative certainty about their capabilities is not going to increase with the new president. So if you, if you agree with me that central challenge is the lack of, lack of knowledge of the relative strengths and that inability to credibly commit today to what will happen after the U.S. pulls out, two, strategic, uh, uh, two strategies seem to make sense. First is make a credible long-term commitment. We're going to be there for 50 years, come hell or high water, which seems to be extremely difficult in the current political environment, probably an incredible, or get out tomorrow. And it will be extremely bloody. And i got to say, when they bring Iraq experts together, we know we can give pretty good estimates of how much it will cost to remain in Iraq indefinitely in terms of blood and treasure. Estimates of the cost and the violence if the U.S. gets out vary tremendously, but they're all pretty high. And that's going to be the central challenge the day after the election when they start getting briefings. What will happen in the, announce, in the event of an immediate pullout? What will happen in this case, this case, and this case? And there's a lot of uncertainty about that. And I think it's going to be extremely difficult for Barack Obama to withdraw large numbers of U.S. forces in the first, few, in the first term. Because it's going to be pretty clear that no matter what he does, it's going to get much worse. It's unclear how much worse. I, I've learned the hard way in the past six months. You can't use the R word, Rwanda, around Democratic congressmen. I'm very sensitive about this. But it'll be very difficult for Barack Obama to draw down large numbers of U.S. troops in the first term. Because if he does, he's setting himself up to allow the Republicans to run against him in four years from now on a You Lost Iraq campaign. So if you're going to see down decreases in large numbers of U.S. troops, I predict it'll happen in the first term, I'm sorry, in the, in the first year of a second Obama term or in the first term of a McCain presidency. Because I think counterintuitively, it would be much easier for John McCain, for domestic political reasons, to decrease the number of US troops in Iraq than it would be for Barack Obama. And from everything Senator McCain has said, he seems very unlikely to, to go down that route. So I'll conclude by finally saying, is Iraq civil war exceptional? Do we think Iraq civil war is different from lots of other civil wars that we've seen in the past 50 years? Well. We have no reasons to think it really is so. Civil war since 1945, lots of recent studies have shown, have typically concluded not by a peace agreement, 
but through a decisive military victory for one side over the other. Of the 54 cases of civil war that have concluded since 1945, in which case, in, in, in which the fight was over control over the central state, only 17% of them ended with a power sharing agreement. It's very, very rare that civil wars end with power sharing. And these cases are El Salvador, 1992, South Africa, 1994, Tajikistan, 1998. Instead, civil wars end with military victory. The government crushes the rebels in 40% of cases. Rebels control, rebels win control of the center in 35% of the cases. And the average duration of these is greater than 10 years. And the median duration is seven years. So buckle up, we've got a couple more years to go in Iraq. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, the third speaker uh, is Peter J. Katzenstein. Uh, Peter is the Walter S. Carpenter Professor of International Studies at, at Cornell. Uh, his work addresses issues of political economy, security, culture, uh, uh, and culture in world politics. He's the author, co-author, editor, or co-editor of over 30 books and over 100 articles and book chapters. He's the president-elect of the American Political Science Association uh, starting in September. That, I must say, is the highest uh, really honor for, for someone in our profession. So uh, um, it, that, I think, uh, is a, is a measure of, of his stature uh, in American political science. In 1987, he was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Oops, and uh, <laughs> um, he joined the Department of Government in 1973. He's chaired or been a member of more than 100 dissertation committees since he's been at Cornell. He received uh, the distinguished sorry, the, the Cornell Colleges of Arts and Sciences, uh, Stephen and Marjorie Russell Distinguished Teaching Award in 1993, uh, and in recognition of sustained and distinguished undergraduate teaching, he was made one of Cornell University's Stephen H. Weiss Presidential Fellows in 2004. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Peter Katzenstein. Well, I noticed a distinct chill as David wound up his uh, talk. I felt it, you felt it, uh, because that analysis is pretty compelling. Uh, but I think uh, uh, we are here also to entertain, and professors are shameless. We dress up, but we are shameless. <laughs> I thought for doing this sort of thing, you know, I faintly recall I'd done a talk like this not so long ago, and I looked around in my files, and there, trustee talk, October 20th, 2007, Rupture or Reorientation, American Foreign Policy on the Road to 2008. Overall Argument, Continued Polarization of Domestic Politics, uh, Reorientation, Not Rupture and Foreign Policy. I thought, oh, good, I don't have to prepare. That was last night. <laughs> then I get this email exchange between Nick and David. Uh, David, is it fair to say you will primarily discuss? We always prepare just the evening before. We're just like our students, okay? <laughs> Don't get, the, don't get the mistaken impression that we prepare. We wing it, okay? <laughs> Is it fair to say that you will primarily discuss Iraq? Peter, what kinds of issues were you thinking of covering? As I mentioned, I will try to be provocative, writes Nick, and suggest that much less will change with a new president than may be thought. David, hi Nick and Peter, I'll discuss Iraq. I will also be provocative and suggest that little will change. <laughs> hi, David. Here's what I said. OK, in that case, I will be contrarian and try to be boring. <laughs> and argue, in fact, that it makes a difference whether McCain or Obama get elected, just as it made a difference that it was Bush rather than Kerry or Gore. I know it's an untenable position to argue, but what the hell, I'm close to retirement and can make a fool of myself. <laughs> so. The cynicism of the smart and young and the idealism of the stupid and old. <laughs> I belong to the, other, the last category. Uh, so it's true, if you look at Obama's speech on Monday uh, before APEC, you know, not much change, and I'm sure we'll come, come to it. Uh, 
But it's also true looking at newspapers, as Schopenhauer wrote, is looking at the second hands of history. They always tell the wrong time. <laughs> so I'm going to try to put in the next 15 minutes the topic of foreign policy in the election into somewhat broader perspective. Um, so about us at home, the first point. I think we at home are, are made up out of dueling traditions. And we think of it as two Americas, you know, red and blue, but actually I come up with eight or nine or ten. Uh, because what defines us are these combinations and recombinations of dualities. The four most salient ones, which we have seen in this election uh, and in the last eight years, are of course, and they are reflected in the electoral map, the sectionalism of this country. Uh, liberalism and conservatism, of, uh, of course, but think of liberalism and racism. Okay? We have struggled with that in this campaign, uh, but not just in this campaign. Think of the archetypical liberal, Woodrow Wilson. Okay? When I read my papers and books and foreign policy now, Woodrow Wilson is always regarded as the somewhat flaky idealist. Well, I just came back from East Asia where I traveled for a month. Woodrow Wilson is known for one thing. He's a racist. He was the man who vetoed the racial equality clause in 1919 at, the, at uh, uh, Versailles. He was a man of the South, Virginia, and believed strongly in the superiority of the white race. Well, we've sort of elided that. This is not part of our liberalism, no, my God. Except, of course, you see it in Appalachia. You see it inside the Democratic Party. You couldn't miss it in this election. So liberalism and racism, right? Uh, well, what about conservatism and religion? Close cousins, right? But not just conservatism and religion. Think of liberalism and religion. Think of that in this election campaign. Uh, and so you can go down the list and combine these binaries and say, they are actually what we are, and we are remaking them all the time. And we're making them not in the politics of consensus. I think Nick is right. We are making them as a fight. Uh, and what's remarkable about this election is, and we don't have data on it, we don't understand it, that a whole stratum of society has been politicized in a way which has not been politicized since the mid-1960s. Then it was the draft. Here it's something new and different. And it's, it's something new and different which you can measure in the amount of money which Obama's raising, which comes from people who never participated. We don't know what it's going to do to the elect electoral map. In that sense, I think it's a really unusual election. Uh, so here you have eight years of what liberals tend to think of a great deviation. And at the end of it, we get a black and a woman battling to become the presidential nominee. There's only one country in the world where this could happen. That's the United States. Uh, we have a greater regenerative capacity than any other society I know. Uh, now take the counterfactual and say, if Clinton had won, it would have been a return to the past. It would have unified the Republicans. It would have sidelined the independents. It would have created the grounds for another run of another Bush for the presidency in 2012 or 2016. It would have become the Filipinization of the United States. Huh? Uh, now think about McCain. What's nice about being a professor, you get the mic for 15 minutes, OK? <laughs> After that, you got the mic for 45. So. What about McCain? McCain becomes president. The Republican right is extremely suspicious. He'll have to go after the Reagan Democrats, and he'll have to convince the independents. It will be a notable shift in policy and coalitions in Washington. What if Obama becomes president? He'll have to convince a core constituency of the Democratic Party, which is deeply suspicious. He'll have to win the Reagan Democrats. And he has to mobilize the independents. And most importantly, he has to continue to mobilize new people into politics. And the reason that the superdelegates picked him and not Hillary, I think I'm convinced of it, was thinking long term about the future of the Democratic Party. That this guy is a ticket for the future, even if he loses the, uh, the presidency. So I think they were thinking institutionally, less in personality. So I think, you know, in terms of the election, this is an unusual election, uh, and it will be consequential who wins. Um, so if you think about it doesn't matter, you know, as Ralph Nader did in 2000, I think it's not true. I think it doesn't matter. Um, 
So let's move from us to them, okay, abroad, uh, and our standing abroad. Uh, here is something which I'm sure David has seen. Misreading the Arab media, this was an op-ed piece uh, uh, in the Sunday Times, May 25th, but very much confirmed by lots of pupils. You know, I did a project on anti-Americanism. Attitudes to the United States, US policy, 89% unfavorable, 11% favorable in the Arab world. That's actually more favorability than three years ago when in the most favorable country, Jordan, 4% were favorable to the US policy. That was the most favorable country, 4%. Uh, towards the United States, 77% unfavorable, 23% favorable. The United States connotes politics. Towards American people, 38% unfavorable, 62% favorable. The anti-Americans abroad is not anti-American people, it's anti-American politics and foreign policy. And this has been true for 30 or 40 years. The figures are less extreme in other parts of the world, but they're there. Uh, now the other sorts of news which I occasionally read, the Ithaca Journal. <laughs> Thursday, June 5th, okay. World sees Obama as a positive. And here's a at the very end, you know, uh, the Times of London editorial, Obama waits on, the waits on the threshold of history, said an editorial, has rekindled America's faith in its prodigious power of reinvention and the world's admiration for America. I think this is true for Europe. I think this is certainly true for Africa. I think it's true for Latin America from the little I know about it. It's not particularly true for East Asia, for example. Right? They like Bush just fine. Right? Yeah. Obama is a little weird. Uh, uh, <laughs> So this clearly, the standing and the election, it, it will resonate differently in different parts of the world. And the reason for that, and Nick alluded to it, is that the structure of the world is more regionalized than we think it is. It's not just one global world out there. Actually, there are different regional orders. And given that it's true, the anti-American sentiments are regionalized. They come in the plural. It's not us against them. It's not why do they hate us. Not at all. They don't hate us in the Middle East, okay? Uh, they hate some things about us, right? They like some things about us. Uh, so this, this complex uh, uh, sense of sentiments, I think, is there, and any foreign policy will have to take account for it. Uh, I think it reflects a structure which is different from the structure of world politics as we still think about it. For example, with the language of, we are the one superpower. We aren't, we aren't. As Nick rightly points out in the next sentence, the power is useless in many situations. So this power configuration differs, and we have a different sense of strategic priority in different parts of the world. We always thought East Asia and Western Europe were very, very important, and so was the Middle East. Latin America we took for granted, and we didn't care about South Asia and Africa. These things shift over time. Uh, and uh, uh, we will have to see how, how it will shift because of a new face uh, in the White House. Whether that's a white face or a black face, it doesn't matter. Uh, typically, anti-American sentiments have been strongest among our allies. That's the major finding. They hate us more. It's not our enemies. They already hated us. Okay? <laughs> uh, it's our allies. And I can tell you autobiographically, why is anti-Americanism so strong in Germany? We are one of the most pro-American countries in Europe over the last two generations. And the reason is they became American. We re-educated them. We told them multilateralism is a good thing. Not being militarist is a good thing. The rule of law, it's a good thing. Okay? And then we turned the tables on them. And they scratched their head. Wait, we just studied really hard for 50 years. We learned all of this. <laughs> and now you're saying it's a new rule book? We don't want to study. We are the Americans now. You are the old Germans. We hate you. Okay? The Germans hate old Germans. Right? They're the new self-righteous Germans. And we actually took the theory geopolitics from 19th century Germany. And that's what they read in the vice president's office. So it's not a surprise that you find then lots of Germans saying, choice between Bush and Saddam Hussein? It's very simple. The devil is Bush, not Saddam Hussein. Right? And that source of disappointment, I think, is much stronger among our allies than among our adversaries, who looked at it as always as saying, 
Well, we are people. We don't like them. Okay. <laughs> so, third point. What's the consequence? There's one consequence for power, and Nick alluded it, this difference between hard power and soft power. And I want to play on this a little. Our hard power has been depleted. The strongest critics of the Bush administration are inside the military. Because Bush inherited the most, the most finely honed military sword which history had produced in 2000. And he's blunted it. And it'll take five to 10 years and trillions of dollars, trillions. We're not talking about fighting the war. That was also trillions. Trillions of dollars to get the military back into shape. The professional military is fully aware of it. Right? That's why they're so strongly opposed to this administration. Uh, so, and then look at the conservative economic policy of the last eight years. Okay? Even more reckless than the Reagan economic policy. I tend to be a sort of middle of the road on economic matters, you know, slightly Keynesian, a true burger of Hamburg. They made money by spending it cautiously. Well, we didn't spend money cautiously. We spent it as much as we could, thinking it had all to be just be printed, okay? Or be financed by somebody else. Well, we've done very well with this. The financing, Saudi Arabia, Japan, now China. We're taking other people's money and we're burning it. And now, you know, when I go to Europe, as I am next week, I'm saying, ouch, okay? It's really expensive. The subway ride in London, eight pounds. Thank you very much. That's a lot of money, yeah, 12 bucks. Uh, so the economic deficits and the military refurbishing will take a lot of effort. It will constrain whoever gets elected. Doesn't matter, okay? So the, we will have a harsh pinch. So our hard power is going to be in short supply. And what does hard power mean? It's power you own. It's direct when you exercise it. It's targeted. It's visible. It shapes behavior. That's how I thought about my older brother, right? <laughs> Piece of cake on the table. He was five years older. He ate it, OK? <laughs> and he would exercise hard power when the parents were not in the room <laughs> to get that cake. So here's the other power, the soft power. It's the power of emulation. It can be replenished. It's not something you own. It's conferred upon you. Right? Teachers have that kind of power if they're successful in the, in the classroom. Uh, it's indirect. It's diffuse. It's invisible. And it's mostly discursive, expressed through ideas and talk, not behavioral. Uh, it's what you can see in action when Obama talks. When Obama talks, some of his best speeches aren't just flattering his audience. Okay? He says, yes, I want tuition benefits. The crowd in Wisconsin roars. Then he says, time out. And you're going to work for it. The crowd gets very quiet. Okay? <laughs> so he is exercising power of a certain kind. I would call it soft power. And it exists internationally. We have exercised that power after World War II. Less than we think we did, but we did it to a very considerable degree. Uh, and in no place more than in Europe. Uh, the entire European Union experiment of blending together, pooling your sovereignty, was an American idea. It started with the Marshall Plan. You know, the Marshall Plan was giving away a lot of money with one string attached. You've got to spend it together. The Europeans said, well, what a cool idea. You never came up to us, right? We used to spend our money alone. Now we spend it together. 50 years later, you got the euro. Uh, so soft power, rhetoric, persuasion, framing, it's all part of the same thing. And it leads to prestige, standing, and legitimacy. Legitimacy, everybody in America now understands, including the right, including the neoconservatives, is priceless. In November 2003, having flaunted the United Nations, we crawled back on our knees and says, please help us. And the United Nations says, it's all yours. Thank you very much. We're not helping you. They're not willing to legitimate what you have done. And to re-earn legitimacy is a difficult task. But you can do it through two things. You could apologize. Now, this is hard to do when you're a big power. Big powers don't apologize easily. Clinton did it after 
he left office for Rwanda. It was, a, I thought, one of his greatest acts, okay, to apologize for the Rwanda. But, uh, but it's not what's, what normally what great powers do because they look forward and politicians never look back. Or you exchange the face. Okay? And this election is about changing faces. Uh, so I think, therefore, it's important. Now, it's Joe Nye who writes about soft power a lot, says, smart power is about the proper combination of hard and soft power. Uh, and that is what Obama's talking about. Obama's quite tough on the war on terror. He is going to get us more into Afghanistan. Whether he gets us out of Iraq or not, he will get us deeper into Afghanistan. No question in my mind. He probably will get us unilaterally into Pakistan. Okay? Because that's in eastern Pakistan where, 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 where the Taliban is hiding. So uh, despite NATO reluctance, despite the European craziness, uh, because I think he wants the war on terror to be fought. He's not saying, oh, no, there's no war on terror. He says there is a security risk there. I think he's convinced that weapons of mass destruction are a security risk. They need to be secured. Okay? Um, but he also will have other agendas, which McCain also embraces, which would include the environment and human rights. Both of them will take a very different stand on environmental and human rights issues. Um, so these two politicians vying now for offers, one black, one white, are competing in the middle for a constituency which has been polarized for too long. And Whoever wins, it will make a difference. I'm quite sure of that. Let me talk about the second consequence before concluding. That consequence is for ourselves. I think in the last eight years, particularly in the first three, our core values were pushed aside, hollowed out and undermined in what I would call a moment of madness. Now, in a history, a moment of madness, three or four years, is a very short time. Okay? As American society has a great regenerative capacity, we found our wits within four or five years. And living through it is quite terrifying. You know, I'm moderate as I am in my politics. I did compare the United States in my classes to Germany in 1930. Not in 1933, but we suspended the Constitution, which I thought was extremely foolish. There were only two groups which opposed this, the extreme left and the extreme right. They were opposed to this. They saw the risks. But the entire middle ground including the Council on Foreign Relations and the New York Times, and that whole sugar just went along. Okay? And it was a very risky period. And I never doubted for one second that we would find our way again. And we did. So I think what this election is about is for us to be able to start believing in us again, because we didn't. Uh, and if you don't have a sense of self about yourself, you don't know what issues are coming down your way. All you know is without a sense of self, you won't be able to act. There's no way of acting consistently without knowing who you are and what you stand for. And America has always, fighting as they do, fighting about the sense of self, the civic nationalism on the one hand, the ethno-nationalism on the other. It has always had core values, which we all agreed on. These core values were at risk in the last four, five, six years. They're no longer at risk, I think. I think the tide has turned. And this election is about reaffirming that they're not at risk and giving us a sense of self from which you make choices. So let me conclude. Uh, the disagreement about, you know, there's not much change, there is change, is age old in the social science and in politics. It's a disagreement about structure and free will. Uh, and the two are interconnected, and that interconnection is not specific to America. So it is an enduring truth shared by East and West. So here's the Oriental version. I taught a CEU seminar here earlier this week, and I see many familiar faces in the audience, which is heartening. Uh, and I learned there from Robin that uh, the fortune cookie was invented in Japan, not in China. Right? <laughs> Most of these foods don't come from the places where you think they come from. Uh, the hamburger comes from Hamburg, not from the United <laughs> States, OK? Uh, anyway, and that the, that the anagrams in the fortune cookie are ungrammatical not because the master says so, but because the people didn't translate well, OK? So here's the anagram from one of my fortune cookies. Because your task is great and will take a 1,000 years, you must start today, not tomorrow, OK? The master said, okay, without an S. Uh, 
And I think, as I grow older, this is really true. When I was young, I said, oh, a big task, a thousand years, I think I'll go to the beach today. No longer, there's not enough time, okay? I start today. And here's the Occidental version. I have on my desk a picture of a wood pile with an inscription from Thoreau, and it says, every man, I don't think every man, I think every man, looks at his wood pile with a kind of affection. I certainly do. I think we all like our wood piles. Uh, and underneath, I pinned a little quotation from Beckett. One of his characters says, I cannot go on. I must go on. Try again. Fail again. Fail better. I think that's true for me. I think that's true for you. I think that's true for us. So in a broader perspective that moves away from the second hands of history, it is this kind of failure, I think, that this election is about. Thank you.